Quick question, how many here support increased happiness, harmony, and prosperity? Anybody support those things? All right, fantastic. And that's, uh, that's wonderful, most people do, and yet the Gallup organization tells us that when we look at the American workplace, only 30% of American workers are engaged and inspired at work. Well, it's great if you're in the 30%. What if you're in the 70% that are disengaged and uninspired at work? Gallup goes on to tell us that 20% of American workers are actively disengaged, and they link this active disengagement to bosses and managers. In fact, the CEO of Gallup says that these employees have bosses from hell that make them miserable, cause them to roam the hallways spreading discontent. Not a very pretty picture. And the costs of this active disengagement are staggering. Gallup estimates that the costs of active disengagement are $450 to $550 billion a year in lost productivity. Well, is there a solution to this management purgatory that we find ourselves in? Perhaps. We should start by asking a few key questions. First, if people know how to do their jobs, why do they need a boss? And secondly, we know that people make all kinds of life-altering decisions without a boss. They decide who to date, who to marry, where to go to college, what to major in, where to live, what to do for a living, whether to buy a house, buy a car, have children. Somehow they make all these decisions without a boss. And yet when they enter the portal of the American workplace, Suddenly, they're too stupid to do anything without a boss. Why is that? Is it possible, just possible, that we can move beyond the old command and control model of management that was designed in the 1800s for the railroads at a time when information moved at the speed of Morse code to a more networked model designed for the 21st century where information moves at the speed of light. Back in 1990, in the spring, there was a, a tiny band of colleagues working out of a little farmhouse in Central California. And they'd been pulled together by entrepreneur Chris Roofer for a project called Morningstar. And the reason that I know about this is I was one of those colleagues. I was the financial controller of the project. And our mission was to construct and operate a new state-of-the-art tomato processing facility. And this farmhouse was a buzzing beehive of activity. We had stakeholders coming through every day, customers, suppliers, contractors, job applicants, bankers, lawyers, attorneys. And they were all vitally interested in the success of this new venture. And one day, Chris came in and said, you know, I'd like to call a colleague meeting and talk about how to organize this thing. I have some ideas I'd like to share about that. So we said, sure. And we met together as a group, about 24 colleagues with him that night in a dusty construction trailer on the job site. And he said, I'd really like to organize this without any human bosses. I'd like the boss of this enterprise to be the company mission statement. This struck us as radical. None of us had grown up or been experienced in an organization like this before. All of our jobs had been hierarchies. Many of us came from the military. We were curious to learn more. He said, I'd like to organize this enterprise about two key principles. Number one, human beings should not use force or coercion against other human beings. When you think about that principle, it's really the foundation of all law everywhere in the world. Every law against assault and battery and theft and burglary and rape and kidnapping mur and murder is predicated on the idea that people should not use force against other people. And he said the second principle is that people should honor the commitments they make to others. And when you think about that principle, it's also the foundation of law, especially civil law. After all, what is contract law if it's not about honoring commitments to others? And we recognize that these human principles are kind of like physical principles, like gravity. If I choose to respect the principle of gravity, I will not step off a tall building and suffer dire consequences. And to the degree we respect and honor these principles of human interaction, 
as a group, we should experience more what? Happiness, harmony, and prosperity. And so at the end of the evening, we all looked at each other and said, well, we can't think of any reason not to adopt these principles. Let's go. And to the best of my knowledge, that moment marked the birth of organizational self-management, at least at the scale of a large manufacturing enterprise. We had lots of work to do. This was March of 1990. We had tomatoes coming up out of the ground. We had vital equipment arriving on ocean cargo freighters from Italy. We had hundreds of contractors on the job site working day and night, fabricating, welding, constructing. We had people to hire. And finally, on July 16, 1990, the first loads of tomatoes rolled through the gate. We turned on the equipment, and we produced 90 million pounds of tomato paste for the world market and changed the course of an entire industry. And we did it all without a single human boss. The company went on to grow. We added another factory and then another factory. We extended operations up and down the supply chain toward customers and warehouses and toward the farm in terms of harvesting and transplanting and farming. We grew to hundreds of year-round employees, thousands of seasonal employees. We became the largest tomato processor in the world. And I believe everyone in this room and everyone in North America has eaten our product because it goes into everything you can think of from ketchup to salsa, steak sauce, barbecue sauce, pizza sauce, spaghetti sauce, and myriad other products. And we did it all without a single human boss. In 2008, we formed the Morning Star Self-Management Institute to promote the ideas and philosophies and practices of self-management. In December of 2011, the Harvard Business Review published an article by Gary Hamill about Morning Star in which he said, at the core of Morningstar's eccentric yet effective management model is a simple idea, freedom. I can personally attest to the exhilaration I felt as I experienced that freedom. I was able to travel all across America and all around the world and get involved in marketing and sales and production issues, things I could never have touched in any other company as a financial controller. It was exhilarating. There are some corollaries to this idea of self-management that are kind of interesting. First of all, no one can be fired. There's no command authority. No one can walk up to another colleague and say, we are terminating your employment. Similarly, no one can direct the activities of others. No one can go up to a colleague and say, stop doing X and start doing Y. There's simply no command authority. Leadership is earned through trust, communication, and respect. It's not conveyed by title. There are no titles. Not everyone thrives in self-management. People that like to give orders do not thrive in this environment because no one has to listen to them. <laughs> People that lack initiative tend to struggle in this environment as well because self-management requires active communication on the part of transmitters and receivers of information. And communication requires initiative. Some companies try to get out of this management purgatory by uh, developing empowerment programs. We don't really talk about empowerment in self-management. Empowerment implies that one person with power is lending their power to a subordinate who has less power. The problem with this scenario is that what is loaned can be repossessed. People in self-management have all the power they need from day one to acquire resources, build relationships, and do their best work. Self-management is beyond empowerment. Self-management is power itself. Other companies try to get out of management purgatory by trying to address work-life balance. And we don't really talk about work-life balance in self-management because work is just part of life. Everyone I've ever worked with, to the best of my knowledge, has been alive. 
What we do in self-management is we make work enjoyable by keeping scorecards and turning work into a game. In self-management, there are no bosses to tell people if they're doing a good job or not. People have to keep scorecards. And I have to tell you, it's incredibly refreshing to work with people who cannot wait for the weekend to be over so they can come back to work Monday morning and play the game of work. There are lots of people who are skeptical about self-management. Many, many skeptics. And uh, I met a business professor, a respected business professor, a few years ago. And he said, you know, this idea of self-management is very cute, it's very funky, very interesting. But you know what? It would never work in a complex environment like airplane manufacturing. And I thought to myself, are you kidding me? The colleagues I work with deal with enzyme kinetics, plant genetics, cell biology, meteorology, thermodynamics, global currency exchange, dozens of other disciplines I can barely pronounce. I think we do a lot more than smash tomatoes. I think we're pretty complex. <laughs> other people are skeptical because they fear that abandoning the old hierarchical management model could lead to a loss of control. They're fearful that they would actually lose control of the enterprise. And I asked them, if your particular organization maps to the statistics presented by the Gallup organization, you don't have control right now. <laughs> and then I asked the question, who's more likely to spot a threat or an opportunity in the workplace? A manager who wanders through a work area three or four times a day, or a colleague who is stationed there continuously throughout an entire shift? The answer is self-evident. The way Morningstar instantiates control in self-management is that it creates an instrument called a colleague letter of understanding. And the colleague letter of understanding represents specific, explicit agreements between peers, each of whom has an equal voice, defining specifically what their mission is, their roles, responsibilities, and performance measures. And people sign these agreements with each other and thereby implement self-management. Can you guess what this is? This is the Morningstar organizational chart. This chart extracted data from colleague letters of understanding and plotted it in space in a university computer lab. Each node represents an individual colleague. The lines represent the commitments that the colleagues have made to each other. There's no up or down. There's no hierarchy, just a robust network. This model represents greater control, not less control. This is like a spider web. If you brush a spider web, you can damage it, but it's quickly rebuilt. If individuals leave the enterprise, responsibilities and roles are reallocated. In a sense, it's a self-healing organism. And the cool thing about this organizational model is that information travels freely throughout the entire enterprise. There are no inherent barriers anywhere to information movement. And the other important thing is that innovation can arise from any point in this network and does. Management is nothing more than a social technology to get work done in organizations. With the rise of the internet, this is arguably the best time to adopt the management models of the future 
in order to build the organizations of tomorrow? Is it time to go beyond empowerment and let people manage themselves in the workplace the same way they already manage themselves in their own personal lives?